This morning's message has really come out of the past few weeks of prayer because we've been going deeper in prayer. So this, this message has really come out of prayer. And Father, I pray for a revelation of the bride. I pray for a revelation of something of the bride. If you could please put that slide on now. Eric, thank you. I pray for a revelation of the love of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus. I, I just believe, I don't, no matter how badly broken a person is, no matter how badly broken, give me a little bit more sound please, thank you. No matter how badly broken a person is, if a person can be encouraged to get to the feet of Jesus and stay there, their life will be healed, okay? I love, you love the story, you know, the, the lady at the feet of Jesus who washed his feet with her hair. And this stands for men who are broken as well. Broken men, broken women, broken people. If we can just get to the feet of Jesus. we There's a one-step program, okay? A one-step program. There's the feet of Jesus. Just get to the feet of Jesus and stay there. And just live your life in his presence. And pour out your pain there. Pour out your... Get, get your... Your brokenness healed there, okay? Everything about your life and stay there. It's a place of power and it's a place of humility, okay? Just that, that's life in the bride. And uh, I want to go straight into the Word of God. Psalm 51 verse 17 says that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. And this is a little bit from last week. Uh, and this was on the end of last week's message, and it didn't really get the, well, bring it this week. So, you've heard this verse of scripture, yeah? This is a really, really strong, the Hebrew language here is very, very strong. It's almost difficult it's, if you actually look at it. The word sacrifice in both the Old and the New Testament means to kill something. It means something has to die. So when we bring a sacrifice of prayer, Hebrews 13, something is dying. Something is dying. You know, the Christian life, walking with Jesus, is a, like a cycle of death, burial, resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection. Things in our life, we're, we're offering ourselves to Him, and there's a sense of the dying of Jesus Christ. We are united with Him in His death, in His burial, in His resurrection. And it's an ongoing thing. It's not a thing like the death of the world. There's a sweetness and a beauty in knowing the death of Jesus working in your life because it's your life is becoming an offering to him. It's not your own anymore. And in that dying, there's a burial and there's a resurrection. It's such a beautiful thing uh, because we get free from our worst enemy, which is ourself. The self-life, it's so, so the, the, the word self, it begins with, you know, guess where, guess who encourages us to live in ourself? Where that comes from? It comes from that old snake. Uh, and so the word sacrifice is a strong word. And the, and the word broken and the word contrite is really strong. It means to be crushed. It means to be wrecked. The word broken and the word contrite mean the same thing. It means to be totally crushed and wrecked. Crushed and wrecked. And the word of God is saying that this is the type of worship that God will not despise when there's something about the spirit and the heart of a human being when it gets crushed and wrecked for him. That is a worship and an aroma that God receives. Now this being broken is very, very different from the... This, listen to me carefully. There's two different types of brokenness. There is the brokenness that God needs to heal in our life that comes from trauma, that comes from abuse, that comes from rejection, that comes from all the horrors that happen to human beings. You know, this is why Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. You know what a broken heart is? A broken heart is not just, oh, somebody left me. A broken heart is a fragmented personality. It's when the core of who you are is fragmented. And the anointing of the Holy Spirit is here to heal your fragmented personality. 
That's what the anointing for. That's the brokenness that God wants to heal us from. That's a different type of brokenness. But here's a brokenness that this is the worship that God is looking for. A spirit and a heart, the core of a man or woman that is wrecked and that is crushed. Broken open like the woman who brought her alabaster box to Jesus. God is looking, Jesus is looking for some people to break their aloe box this morning. God is looking for some people to break some aloe box, alabaster boxes in their life. Where you're just going to say, I just do not care anymore. And if you're watching me, you could be a crackhead. You could be the worst, in the worst kind of sin and bondage ever. You could, life could be a train wreck. But something in you on the inside says, Jesus, I believe you are my saviour. And I don't care. Here is my alabaster box. Broken, crushed and wrecked. I'm yours forever and I don't care. And I don't care about cool worship. Cool worship is not the sacrifice. Cool worship is not a, a, a broken, crushed, ruined, wrecked. Heart and spirit. That's the worship that God is looking for. And it, it, it's Jesus modeled it in his life. And Hebrews 10 said, when Jesus came into the world, he said, uh, you know, burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. You don't desire, but you've given me a body. But a body you have prepared for me. Now that body prepared for him was going to go to the cross. Now we don't have to go to the cross to pay for the sins of anybody. But God has given us a body. Given us a vessel. And our basic act of worship is to yield the whole thing back to him. All of your body, your mind, your faculties, everything. That's our reasonable act of, of worship. And it just says, Jesus said, this is Jesus speaking, but it's written in the book of Hebrews. It says, I have come to do your will, O God. You know, that's a simple thing. It's a very simple sentence, isn't it? To say, I want to do the will of God. I've been a Christian, I think, 26 years, I think. I've lost count. I've lost, I've lost track of time. Been a Christian a long time. And, and, and I remember when I was a young Christian, put my hand up. I want to do the will of God. I want to do the will of God. And God said, okay, I'm going to work some things in you. Or to do the will of God, there's a battle to do that. And last week we looked at this passage from 2 Corinthians 10. And it says, though we walk in the flesh, we don't walk in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Or pulling down strongholds, casting down. Say casting down. Yeah. Casting down. That word casting down in Greek means to demolish. It's similar. It means to wreck. It means to ruin. Cast down. It means to demolish. Absolutely demolish. Cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So God, God this is saying, look, the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit is saying, God wants to demolish our strongholds and our strongholds are not just so much the things that hinder our life like I need inner healing and we all need some inner healing. The strongholds are the things that impede the flow of His life in us. They hold Him back in us. Strongholds don't so much hold you back, they hold him back from him having his way in our life and so a life that allows him in is a life where things have been demolished things have something's been wrecked and something's been crushed the self will the pride's gone the things God is used to process us. We we come God is finally saying, through these shakings, I'm having a bride. And God doesn't play games with people, but I'm having a people who 
don't resist me. Because their, their heart and their spirit, the self-will has been crushed, broken and wrecked. It's been demolished and pulled down. And they have been brought into the obedience of Christ, which is what it says in 2 Corinthians 10. They are now in the obedience of Christ. Well, what does that look like? The obedience of Christ looks like this. Lord, you've given me a body. Here I am. I ain't going to resist you anymore. I just want to do your will, God. And you know, that is a, do you know what? That's a happy life. That's a life without conflict. That's a life without torment. You know, it's, a, it's like saying, Lord, I don't care. Even if I end up under a bridge, as long as you're with me. And you won't end up under a bridge, by the way. People make deals with God all the time. Well, Lord, I'll follow you if this, if that. And it never works. It never, ever works. Hallelujah. You know, there's a deep healing and restoration when we allow ourselves to be broken by God. Because, listen, somebody can be wounded, but they're not broken. Somebody can be wounded, but not broken. The, and, and people can carry sorrow, heaviness, grief, and sadness, but they're not broken. And the Bible talks about in this revelation here in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 it says for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation but the sorrow of the world produces death when a person is perpetually in oppression I'm talking about the Christian if you're a Christian and you're perpetually in a cycle of oppression and woundedness and you're wounded that indicates that the sorrow of the world, this world sorrow, is in you. And it produces death. But there's a sorrow and a repentance that God wants to grant us that leads us to life. But we have to choose, am I going to make an idol out of my pain? Am I going to worship my pain? And I was sharing, I know one of you, you know this, and I'm not thinking of you, but I was sharing this story with you, just so that you know I'm not, this is for us all, I'm preaching to myself. About 20 years ago, I had two friends, one from the south of England, one from the north of England, two men, different friends, different contexts, one from Coventry, one from Newcastle. Both had extremely hard lives. Two, two men. They didn't know each other, but it's weird. Very similar stories. When they were little boys, they both saw their mum get murdered by their dad. Can you imagine what that would do with a six, seven year old little boy? <laughs> it just isn't even bit thinking about. Both lives spiraled completely out of control. Not only did they see their mom die in a horrific circumstance and lose their moms, they lost their dads as well, who, and they ended up in foster. They ended up in care. Their lives spiraled completely out of control into drugs, crime, pet gangs, prison, and both came to Jesus in prison. And I knew both of these men separate. I knew one in Newcastle. And then when uh, later on I moved to Coventry, I met another man. Very similar story. Now where they're both at now, and look, you could say what you got, but they're both hurt. I'm telling you, so much pain. Imagine how much pain and sorrow and horrific trauma. And yet one of them has turned his back on Jesus because he was a bitter man. He never let go of his bitterness and his offense. 
and he's walked away from Jesus and he's on his way to death. The other one, <laughs> the other one is a beautiful story. He's a husband, he's a father, he's blessed, he's got the sweetness and the freedom of Jesus in his life. There's no bitterness, there's no offense, there's no trauma left in him. And he's, he's a full-time evangelist. And he works with offenders and people in prison and bringing them to Christ and helping them get their life back together. This guy's story, I, I, I remember when he first got saved. And his name is John. <laughs> and he was walking through the main shopping centre in Newcastle, Eldon Square. And about 30 security guards were following him because he was a notorious criminal. And he turned around and just said, guys, I'm born again now, I've received Jesus. And they were like, what? Now, John, when he was in prison, he used to be quite, he was a talented artist. He used to draw rude pictures for the other prisoners. And then he came out of prison, he just, I just remember him in his early days in the Lord, he just had Jesus on him. And this guy ended up having an art gallery. Can you imagine how... God bless them with an important art. He had an art gallery. This is a guy who was on the wing in prison. Nothing. He was a her he'd been a heroin addict. But he he'd come to the feet of Jesus and given out all his pain. Because Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And some people literally need to come to the feet of Jesus. And you need to scream and shout and cry your pain out ever. Every single night of it takes it. Come to the feet of Jesus. And let go. Hallelujah. This is what's going to bring people into the bride. This is why we're going to break our alabaster box. You, we can all say, you don't know. No, hey, I, I don't know. Well, you don't know what I've been through either. Jesus knows. Jesus really knows. And he really, really loves you. I mean, loves you. And I pray that that man I used to know in Coventry comes back to the cross. And Jesus is building his bride in and one of the prerequisites, I believe, for the bride is humility and brokenness. Now, some of us need brokenness in different ways. Some of us are very capable people. And quite frankly, we'd be okay in life without God. We need to be broken. To be part of the bride, there has to be no pride. There can't be pride in the bride. There can't be offense. There can't be any of that. And you know, the, the life in the bride is going to be so beautiful, especially in these days ahead. We send a song of songs. Song of songs, chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Oh my dove. This is Jesus speaking to the bride. Just, I'll just stop there. This is Jesus speaking to the church. Now listen, if you're... This will help the guys. Right? This will help the men. Because we, we want manly men in church. Okay? That okay? We don't want chauvinistic men and misogynistic men. Because they're actually not manly. They're insecure. They're men like that lack identity. But we want masculine. We need masculine men in the church. Not weak-willed men. And look, if you're a man and you're listening to me and you're wounded and you lack fatherhood, you lack identity, God is going to heal you and put his fatherhood in you and shape your character and discipline your character. Oh, hallelujah. But you know, the creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. I love that. That means there's a generation going to move in supernatural power. So that's for you ladies too. 
So if I say, are there any sons of God here in the house? We can all say, men and women, go, yep, that's me. Yeah. Creation is groaning both for our manifestation. Yeah. It's not a green new deal that's going to save this planet. You know why the planet's in a mess? Because the planet is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's why. A supernatural company. Wow, I better stop there. So we're all the sons of God, but we're all part of the bride. We're all part of the bride. So this is Jesus speaking to his bride, and he says, Oh my God. This is tender, beautiful language. Oh my dog, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Do you know when there's something in you, even when and you, you might be listening to me, you might think, I am wounded, I am wounded, I am hurting, I'm full of rejection. But you know what? I'm going to bring my alabaster box and I don't care what it looks like anymore. I'm going to break that thing because once it's broken, it's broken. As soon as that alabaster box of your heart starts to crack, as soon as that heart and that spirit on the inside of you begins to break and brokenness starts to work in your life, Jesus smells the sweetness of it. And he starts to call you up higher. And he says to me, I want to see your face. Jesus says, I want to see your face. Yes, you, you felt ugly all your life, un insignificant. Nobody wants to know me, listen to me. I was, all, I, listen, I was always the last one picked in sports for you. In school, you, all the kids sign up, you get the two cool ones. Who's going to be on whose team? I love him, I love him, I love him. I was, well, not completely last, round about the last three or four. You're kind of standing there saying, oh, I'm not the last one. <laughs> anyway, you may have, you may, okay, you might be the first. Well, okay, we'll pray for you as well. Hallelujah. Jesus is saying, Let, I want to see your face. Amen. I want to see your face. The word face means presence. The word presence means face. When we feel the presence of God this morning, that means the face of God is here. God's face has come to see you and he wants to see your face he wants to hear your voice for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely and you might look at yourself and i look at myself and i'm getting some suitcases and big bags here and stuff like that and I'm, oh, face like a million dollars all green and crinkly and jesus says i want to see your face when he sees your face then he, where he says, the li let us catch the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Does that mean Jesus is going to go, duck, 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 fox on me? No, no, no. But as we come into intimacy with him, and he wants to see your face, all those little foxes in your life, those little things that just cause troubles here, agitations there. I'm too busy to seek God. I'm too busy to seek God. Well, if we're too busy, I'm telling you, the devil will make sure there's plenty of little foxes in our life. When we get busy to seek him and break our alabaster box, guess what? The little foxes are going to go out of your life just like that. Amen. Hallelujah. And he's going to take you up high. But catch this. This is the last passage. Song of Songs, verse... I love Song of Songs. Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 2. There's a call for the bride to be inconvenienced for her husband, for her groom. This is not burning, the, listen please here. This is not about burning the people of God out. I've been in church a long time and I've seen Christians get burnt out. Because they usually block themselves for the wrong things. Maybe they're trying to serve so they can feel valued and they just serve in the wrong things. But for the presence of God, where the presence of God is, I want to be inconvenienced. And I think I shared in second service last week, I may have shared in first service, how when we were dating one another, we didn't live together. That's a novel idea, isn't it? Um, it's biblical. Um, and we lived completely the other side of town. We lived in Coventry. 
So I can't remember. I lived in Walls Grave, you lived in Falls Hill. And mobile phones were just coming out then like bricks. I'm telling you, had this woman rang me at 2 a.m. and said, I need you to come and do something for me. Do you know what I would have done? I would have got dressed and I would have gone there. And I didn't have a car. I had a bike. And it wasn't a motorbike. It was a pushback. I would have gone there on a February night at 2 a.m. Boji, you're laughing. Larry, would you have done the same? On a pushbike. I would have been there on my pushbike up the falls hill. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Inconvenience. <laughs> Look at this. Song of Song 5, verse 2. It says, I sleep but my heart is awake. This is the bride speaking. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks. This is Jesus. He knocks in, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I have taken off my robe, how can I put it on again? I have washed my feet, how can I defile them? My beloved, now listen, listen. Jesus is knocking on the door. The bride's in bed. And she's saying, well, I can hear you. And he's telling her how much he loves her. But she won't get up. This speaks of she's afraid to let go and be completely inconvenienced for him. God is looking for a church in Leeds and in the United Kingdom that is lovesick for him and will be inconvenienced for him. Because when we're inconvenienced for him, he's going to be inconvenienced for us. He'll be inconvenienced for you. And, and it says, she's saying, I can't get up. I, I, I've already washed my feet. I don't want to defile them. Obviously, back then it was the custom to wash your feet before bed. Great. Verse 4. My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door and my heart yearned for him. Then she gets up. Verse 5, I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands drip with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. Catch this revelation. The, the bridegroom is at the door. The bride doesn't want to get up to begin with. Then she gets up, and he's, he has touched the door. And there's liquid myrrh on the door. The presence of God is so strong on him that everything he's touched is dripping with liquid myrrh. But when she opens the door, he's gone. You can be in a church where the presence of God is. And you think, oh, I felt the presence of there, but you still missed him. Because he was there and his liquid myrrh is in the atmosphere. But when I come and gather in the assembly with my brothers and sisters, I want to make sure, yes, I'm in the presence, but I don't want to miss him. I want to be inconvenienced for him. God is just saying, I want a church that will inconvenience. This is not driving legalism. I want a church that will inconvenience for my son Jesus. And she opens the door and he's gone. And, and she says, I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. Verse 7, the watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. The church, God wants to restore the church back to this place of intimacy with him, with Jesus. When the church misses this, the bride takes a beating by the watchman of the walls. And in the Hebrew, it means she goes out looking for him on the broad way. You can't find him on the broad way. He's not there. He wants to visit us. Uh, 
He'll come at his time. In the end times, he's coming like a thief in the night. He's coming and he said, I want to take you higher. Will you be a, be, be a people whose alabaster box is broken? You'll surrender all of your pride, all of your offense, everything, all of your pain. Not make an idol of it anymore at my feet and be in convenience. Because then I'll take you really high into the cleft of the rock and every little fox in your life will get dealt with. And I'll keep you safe in these end times. About in the year 2010, you know, I, I, I'll say so. When I received this prophecy from a prophet when I was in Africa, and, some, and this was a, quite a big prophecy, and at the time it sort of made sense, but I can see how and why now, that my assignment in life, uh, and this prophetess in, in Africa, she's a recognized, and her and her husband, and she said to me, like Abraham's servant had to put his hand on Abraham's thigh and swear I will get a bride for your son. And she said, your assignment, your purpose is to do likewise, to get a bride for his son. And it hasn't been a straightforward path since then, but I'll say in these times, it's clear. Because we're in the end times. Jesus is coming soon, like we sang earlier. He wants you to be part of the bride, and in a moment, I just want to play a video. This is a beautiful video. If you could, actually, Eric, if you could just play that now, thank you. And turn it up nice and loud. Uh, the, the, the demo, <gasps> instantly, I was like, oh my gosh. It's so beautiful. I'm like, wow, yes, this is something that I uh, definitely I'm going to use. Whatever you have, I'm gonna, I trust you. I trust the Holy Ghost inside of you. We're going to do this together. So when I began to write, I put myself in the position of of the of the, the ten virgins. But at the same time, it was like simultaneously, I was, I was also like, man, I remember when I was getting ready to get married with my husband, that feeling of about, about to get married with your the man of your dreams and Jesus is the man of our dreams right Jesus is the man of our dreams so what is it like oh my gosh I hope I hope he likes the way I look I hope um oh my god I might get sensitive <laughs> I hope I hope he likes the way I look I hope he likes um when he finds me I hope he likes how I am um I hope he's proud of me when he finds me because I remember when I got ready um for my wedding day I know my husband loves me for how I am I'm like, man, I hope that everything that he's hoped in a life, I hope that he can find that in me. You know, I hope I make him proud. I hope I'm able to um, make him happy. I hope that he loves me for how I am. So when I look back and I think about when Jesus comes for us, without all the mistakes and all the process that we go through, like, that's why in the, in the pre-course of that song, it's like, man, I hope when you find my lamp filled with oil that I'm not distracted, that I'm not something that I appear to be. Like, this is who I am, and I hope, and I hope you love that about me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I was like, wow. What is that feeling like? When you hear that cry, he's coming. The trumpet is sounding, he's coming, we're gonna see him. Oh my God, how is he gonna look like? So that's why, I, when I had that feeling, I was like, oh my gosh. We only have an imagination of what it would look like. And it's like, oh, you, you, I know in my heart, in the heart of hearts, he's going to be way more than I could have ever expected and dreamt of. To me, that's like, no, oh, the whole moment. Like when, the, when the bride, you know, the, in, in, a, in a traditional wedding, the groom is waiting 
on the altar for, for the bride. And I remember that feeling when I came. I was so nervous walking. When I got to the point of when I was about to walk down, I saw him lock his eyes. And I was like, oh my God, he looks so handsome. <laughs> I was like, man, I'm going to be the rest of my life. I'm going to be with this man. And I love him. And it's, he's everything that I've wanted and more. That's why that was like, go, I go out to meet him. What, what is that, that going to look like? So this song is like a love letter to my Jesus. What, you, what is it going to look like? I can only imagine. Well, the Bible says that he's going to dress us up with fine linen and righteousness. Oh my God. He's going to take us by the hand. And, you know, praying and watching and, and I perceive him. I know he's coming closer, but what is it going to look like when we see him? So that was the whole spirit behind that. And I remember I showed up my husband a song. We had no bridge at that point. And I was in the car with him and I go to him, look, I, this is what I feel, but I feel like there's something missing. And then he tells me, he goes to me, you, he goes, you need to put something there. As a bridge, she goes to me, 1 Corinthians 3 19, if I'm not mistaken, where it says, No eye has, no eye has seen what he has heard, um, what he has prepared for those who love him. And I go, That's it. That's what I, yes, this is it. So that's what the bridge came out. So I asked him, like, Well, what was your thought process in that? He goes, Well, um, I'm gonna get sappy again. <laughs> he goes, Um, he was like, well, the song is saying is the song is saying something. It's saying, come, what you know, what is gonna, what is, we can only imagine what this is gonna look like. We don't know what this is gonna look like. We can only imagine by what we read and what our spirit can testify. But um, he was like, the the song is saying, come. That means the song is talking about that he's gonna take us. But where is he taking us? Because it doesn't end by just like, oh, come, Jesus, come, aha. Uh-huh. But there is an after. So it's like, where is this taking us? The Bible says that we have never seen this place. We've never heard about this place. No eye has seen, no ear has heard of a place that he went to go prepare. No, to me that was like, ah! Oh! You know, in John 14, uh, John 14, 3, where he says that I'm gonna go to a place and I'm gonna go prepare it. And I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna take you for myself. I'm going to leave you, and I'm going to come back, though. And when I come back, I'm going to go to a place that I prepared for you, and I'm going to take you up for myself. That's exactly what the Bible says, what he said in red, because Jesus speaks in red. (laughs) I'm going to take you up for myself to a place where I am. So if he prepared it for me, it's because I belong there. We belong there. We belong to be with him. (laughs) 